So hello everyone. Thank you for joining our first Lunch and Learn of 2023. We are doing our series a little different this year where we've planned it out beforehand. And so we're gonna be doing quarterly segments. The first quarterly segment is running January, February, March, focusing on livestock and manure management. So we are very lucky to have Brett Margriff here, who is not only a farmer advocate for conservation, who's already very um, dedicated to soil health, but also a row crop farmer who has been integrating livestock onto his farm and gonna to talk to us more about how the experience has been how it affects soil health and what he's expecting to get out of that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brett, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, AJ. Um, yeah, glad to be here. Glad everybody could join us today. Uh, as he said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, soil health and our venture down that avenue with um, integrating livestock and mostly grazing cover crops. So I'll talk a little bit about the um, touch on the family. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our operation, where we were back in 2016, where we're at today with it, and where we're hopefully heading uh, in the future. So um, as I said earlier, this happens to be a photo that was a plug for the, um, the farmer advocate and their photographer, uh, David, who did a wonderful job. He took this photo on the farm last summer, and uh, I tend to use this quite a bit because it's a, it's a pretty slick photo. Um, this, is, this is an aerial shot taken back in 2016, basically over top our farmstead looking to the southeast, and taken in mid-May, and I guess what do you notice about the, the landscape there? Uh, we're looking at about three to 400 acres. Of ground that we own or control. And I think what stands out is the fact that everything's green. There's something growing everywhere that you look. So we had been doing this cover crop thing for a long time. I mean, we're well into, you know, 15, 20 years. No, I guess actually going on 25 years here in the near future. We're planting 100% no-till. We're planting into 100% cover crops. We're planting those green cover crops at this point we had reduced quite a bit of fertilizer we were reducing pesticides using controlled traffic rotating manures you know so we were doing in my mind pretty much everything that was at the time could be expected in that the idea of chasing soil health so where else were we going to go what was the next step well it seemed like the next step was going to be animals the crazy thing was is at that time, I was 45, 46 years old, never had an animal on the farm other than a dog. What did I know about it? Absolutely nothing. But I really felt like that was the direction we had to go. So I wanted to learn as much as I could, as fast as I could. Again, we, we plant green into everything. This is just planting some corn into a, a cover crop of uh, some rapeseed and some cereal rye and vetch mostly. Um, but just, just to show what we do. I had been pretty active in, in this idea of helping promote and push um, the, these practices for a lot of years. I think this was a grant that we did at my office. I work for the Soil and Water Conservation District in Seneca County. And this, this grant probably takes us all the way back into like 2012 or something. So the idea of soil health is something that you know, we've been pursuing, not only on the farm, but in the, in the job and the role that I, that I work with. Uh, for quite some some time so i decided that in order to learn more about this cattle thing i had to take a trip and uh, i don't know if any of you have heard of these places the minokin farm uh, burleigh county soil and soil water conservation district in north dakota i took a trip up there with one of my co-workers the minokin farm is actually owned and operated by people within the soil conservation district in burleigh county um, some of the people that you might recognize who were involved in that, Jay Fuhrer, he was, he's a USDA retired soil health specialist, and another guy who was involved with that conservation district by the name of Gabe Brown. Um, they were very instrumental in starting that Minokin farm. And what they do at that Minokin farm is basically an inter integration of livestock, and they do a lot of test, test work and studies you know, it's just really fascinating it's a educational property as well they bring uh, groups and people in for two and three days at a time and teach them the concepts of soil health and most importantly how how cattle can be integrated in there it just so happened that i was able to go to kansas that same year 
got to go to the no-till on the plains conference um, where i listened to a speaker by the name of greg judy uh, he's a missouri guy regenerative rancher and an author and if you ever get a chance to read his book or um, listen to him speak he really lays it out simple and makes it so easy to follow of how you can bring livestock onto the farm um, one more person that I got to talk about too is, is Bob Hendershot from Ohio. Uh, he's a grazing and pasture specialist. And it was really nice to have somebody here in Ohio that was a go-to guy as well, that had so much knowledge. And, um, you know, without, without Bob coming on farm, I don't think uh, some of this would have been, we'd have been able to do it. But that was 2016, I went up there to North Dakota, made up my mind that this is gonna happen. I came back in the fall and this brown area that you see right right in here um, that was old marginal pasture that was grown up had lots of locust trees and we basically decided to clear most of that in 2016 we then in the spring we i guess it was in 2016 we planted um, um, pasture seedings in it we had fence built we hired amish builders to come in and put up a high tensile fence um, actually uh, woven high tensile with an electric strand. We learned from it. We figured out how to do that. We now do all of our own fencing just from you know watching and learning them to do it. So we put up a permanent fence around the entire farm. The entire perimeter has five strand high tensile. Um, anything in the middle when we're moving cattle, we use poly wires and, and temporary stuff. Fencing with tread in post. We've added pipeline throughout the farm as well so that we can have water and we can just use uh, portable water tanks and move them around as we need. But so essentially it came down to a decision that, that happened over the course of about two or three months span, going from no animals to committing to go ahead and doing it. Um, as I said, knew nothing about it. I'm not a cattle guy. I won't claim to be. I knew very little about animal nutrition. Everything that I've learned, I've been learning on the go. Um, and what works for us certainly won't work for somebody who wants to try to emulate it or copy it, but they can find parts and pieces of what we're doing and probably make it work for them. But the biggest driving factor for me was when I had somebody tell me, you can't do that here in Ohio. You know, because we were going out to the ranches out west and seeing this happen out there where it gets really cold and the ground freezes. And they said, you can't do that in Ohio. And I said, okay, great. Thanks for the motivation because I think somebody told me that about 20 years ago about no-till corn. You can't make no-till corn work in Ohio. And um, it's kind of fun to prove people wrong because uh, I think we've done it in both ways. Uh, my hope is that one of my sons will end up pursuing like an animal science degree so that we can learn a little bit more about animal nutrition, you know, maybe a little bit more about how we should be handling and, and dealing with the animal while it's here on our farm. But we ended up with a, a registered breed of red pole. Had no intention of having a registered breed, but it's what it is. We've, we've kept it. It's a closed herd. Um, and just uh, for reference, up in the top corner uh, of the right photo there, you'll see a, that's a poly wire, that, a reel. That's what we use to control most of our cattle anytime that we move, temporarily grazing them. So you'll see those poly wires uh, used quite a bit in some of the photos that I'm going to show as, as we move on. Um, after having the cows for a few years, now we have a small flock of sheep. We even have some, some layer hens around the farm that uh, I guess you could almost call them free range, but they're sort of everywhere and sometimes in the way. This chart here is, is really everything. If, if you're interested or if you're thinking any at all about doing this, and I apologize that it's not it's the only one I could find. But this chart lays everything out. This was for me the aha moment. I was at the Midwest Cover Crop Council in East Lansing and Jerry Lindquist presented this up there. It goes, it's a month by month chart of how to work the animals through while incorporating the use of cover crops as your forage for as many months as possible. So right now we're in the month of, February, of January going into February. And so we're obviously on hay feed right now because our animals are on essentially a feed lot um we're going from from slop to freeze slop to freeze so we're basically committed to bale feeding them through the month of, the month of march but once we hit that april window that's when we'll have the animals back out on the fields where we're growing a cash crop 
but currently have a cover crop growing. So we will try to graze our cool season mixes, oats, um, clovers, rye, things like that through the month of April and May, maybe a touch of June. And then as we go from transition from May, June, then we're going to move them on to our permanent pasture. That was the part that I fenced. I showed that was in the brown area in that earlier photo. I go back to here, that brown area, that's our permanent pasture, um, which is fenced. It's about 10 acres. And that's able to get us through that month of June and July. August becomes a bit of a challenge right now. And as we look at the way this graph was put out, they, they're saying we're grazing July, August. We are, but when we get into that dry heat uh, and spell of August, what we found here that we really think that we need is we need a warm season pasture with like native species to be able to get us through that one additional month of August, um, like the blue stems and the bigs and the little blues. I think something along those lines are, are what we want to establish as a permanent pasture as well. And then, then I think it completes this chart and allows us to, to truly feed for three months of January, February, March on bales and to pasture for June, July and August and all the other months remain cover crops. But as we continue to look through this, um, September, October, our warm season mixes, which would be that we plant after we harvest in July. So as soon as the combine goes through the field, we have the drill chasing it and we're planting sorghum sedans and cow peas and oats and, and other things that are going to thrive in, in the heat of the summer. And we're going to get some grazing on those through September, October, November, because they're rapid growing crops. And, you know, they're going to grow shoulder high, lots of mass and uh, lots of time spent on there. And then we transition November, December back into a cool season, ideally probably some oats or some triticale or some peas. So this, this, this chart really was the aha moment. This was when I sort of felt like this is how it all makes sense. And this is how we feed these animals for as many months as we can on something that we're already doing here on our farm, which is growing cover crops almost year round. <clears throat> um, the only thing that's not listed in here that I would say that we do a little of is in May and in October, we will bale some of our cover crops and wet wrap them. And the wet wrap works well because then we don't have to put them inside. We can make, make the cutting of hay, have it baled and have it wrapped all within about a 48 hour window. And that really works well, especially if we're trying to do some in the spring. This is a photo of the cows grazing a warm season mix. Um, you can see in the foreground the area that's already been fully grazed. You'll see the transition into that uh, middle area. There's a temporary wire, just a single wire. The cow's standing right next to it with a tread end post there. And we're just getting ready to go down and set up another, another paddock, which will move from the time this photo was taken, we would move them within hours. Um, <clears throat> they mow this down. It's incredible how fast they can mow something down. It's as tall as they stand, but, but they do. Um, they're always outside. They're trained to the electric fence. Uh, at the end, I'll show a video of how easy it is to move them across from uh, one paddock to the next. So when we set up in an area, a field, a cover crop, this is what we do. We make these mower passes. So we establish our paddocks in advance and we'll set up as many poly wires through this little corridor. And what that does is allows us to set up five, six, seven paddocks, say on a Sunday afternoon, so that every day when we move them, all we do is go down and drop a wire. And we're literally down there for less than 15 minutes uh, when we move the animals. So it's, it's just really something uh, to help speed, speed the process and be a little bit more efficient. This is what it looks like after they fully grazed it. Um, you can obviously see the poly wire with the tread end post. But if you look closely at the ground, all those dark areas are manure. So the cows have done exactly what them what I want them to do. So they they distribute the manure and urine. They trample the remainder of the cover crop, which is essentially carbon, into the ground with their hoof, and that helps push that recycling process of carbon all over again. So really the cows are working for us instead of us working for them. They're 
foraging their own food and spreading their own manure. But the other little part of this that, that comes into play that's, that's sort of overlooked is, is the power of their saliva. So as a cow eats, it uses its tongue to wrap around whatever it's going to pull. And so it wraps that and it pulls that. And so that saliva is spilled around that plant and where that plant is torn, it goes into the plant and as it's, it acts as a stimulant into the roots, it comes off as an exudate it stimulates the biology of the soil. These are all things that I'm, you know, I've read and I've heard and that pe people have talked about. And that's, that's how that whole biology and that cycle continue to work. That they talk about the ruminant and, and the ability of that ruminant to be so productive on our soil. And that's how this is happening. It's, it, it's so much more beneficial than just going out, say, with a bush hog mower and mowing it. Some people say, well, that, couldn't you just do that? Well, you could, but you wouldn't get the effect of the saliva through the plant, through the roots, and into the biology of the soil. And that's really what we're after. Again, doing this on an everyday basis allows this distribution of this manure because we move these cows daily. That's and we keep them in a small confined space. They have to pee, they have to poop everywhere. If they were just given the entire field, in this case about a 25 acre field, it would take years to get this kind of distribution of even distribution of manure. And so that, that's the big advantage to this, this management of grouping. Um, this, uh, we'll talk about the dogs later, but this is the idea of take half, leave half. Um, might be a little bit more than half, but it, it's hard to say. But, you know, when we move them, there's still quite a bit of, of, uh, of uh, plant matter that's still laying on the surface. It's going to decay. It's going to decompose. And we're going to plant right into that come spring. In this case, it's going to become a cornfield. And we'll no-till right into this. Many times I will go in and drill just a, a, a light cover crop of rye right through this to make sure I've got something that winters. I said the animals are outside all the time. Right now they're on a feedlot. This is a situation that they that it looks like here at home right now. Um, we we bale feed them. We got a little small work area so that when we have to uh, um, do any kind of like pinching or banding or any shots, uh, anything that we have to give, because um, you know we vaccinate, we, we try to keep things minimal, but we still have to do it for the health of the animal. It's, it's still important. So like I said, they're outside. This would have been a picture taken uh, just this Christmas when we got that really cold snap that came through, wind chills minus 35, 40 degrees, several inches of snow. Uh, this is just a testament to uh, um, you know, how well these animals maintain their heat through their body coat. Um, this was on early Christmas morning, so the snow had fallen for two days previous. They were still white across the top. They were still healthy animals. What you don't see is to the right of the picture is round bales that have been stacked too high to, to help for a windbreak. I normally don't bed them in our feedlot, but in that case, when we had this extreme cold snap, we did use a bunch of straw bedding just so that they would be able to hunker down um, and be able to keep some body heat in. It's amazing how durable and rugged these creatures are. Um, I was I was nervous about it, but it, again, it just demonstrates that, that how tough they are. So where we're going next, the next direction that we're trying to go, check my time here, see where we're at. We've got about 11 minutes. Okay, about right. So what we're hoping to do, this is kind of the best demonstration that I can visual visually give you. So if you look at the field across the road, um, what we're hoping to accomplish now is, is with the use of what I'm going to call rotational pasture, semi-permanent pasture, where we're going to take some of our worst areas, least productive ground, and we're going to put it into a pasture for about three to five years. Um, these are areas of anywhere from four to eight acres at a time. Um, each year, we're going to try to make one cutting of hay we're going to try to turn the animals across them at least twice so they're not only grazing and eating and saliva comes in contact with the plant but they're also distributing their manure um, and then we want to do this over three to five years and then rotate it back into crop production because what i can't wait to measure is the increased benefits of crop production after we do this and concentrate the animal on it twice a year and so we've got about four places right now that are staged that way. Our first one's gonna come out of production in 2025. 
And so that's when I'll have my first glimpse of, of what's actually happening. And, and if we actually see the increase in production, like I'm hoping for the cash crop. Um, you can kind of see as you look at this, you can see waterways um, in the left hand side and across that field, you can see little swales. We're on a lot of slope here where I'm at. Um, it's not flat. We have a lot of grade. We have a lot of places where water wants to concentrate that will easily break out into gullies if we let it go. So it seems like the perfect fit to try and establish these kind of uh, uh, techniques and then move them back into crop production for a few years and probably cycle them back into what I'm going to call temporary, temporary pastures again. So uh, that's, that's the exciting part right now. We're continuing to increase numbers. We, uh, we want to expand this beyond just the home farm. We, we bought another farm across uh, further east than this, another 100 acres that we're going to try and do the same thing on. Um, it's exciting. Uh, this is just, uh, it's one of the things that it's led to is in this photo is the boys with their 4-H projects, which again, six years ago, they would have never thought they were showing 4-H animals, but because of the impl implementation of the cattle on our farm, this is what it's led to. Uh, we do some freezer beef sales here on the farm, which, you know, it's nice, it's cash flow, and it just continues to proliferate. It's all uh, marketed as grass-fed beef because, you know, it's either grass or forage, and, um, and there is a market out there for that. So some of the challenges um, are mostly weather-related that we deal with, and um, so hot and dry, for example, obviously that becomes a shortage of forage if we start to experience drought and extreme extreme heat and we've seen some of that so far when we get into the really cold and wet periods obviously we're concerned about hoof damage because we don't want to trample up uh, especially crop production areas very much because uh, our goal is to do no tillage and not have to go out and work down you know pugs from the cow hooves and then of course uh, extreme cold is uh, is a little bit of concern again because the animals we have no shelter for them they are 100 percent outside all the time um, sub freezing is perfect you know if we could just maintain 25 to 30 degrees all through the winter months that'd be ideal because we would be able to have stockpile forage on across the farms and let them graze uh, and supplement with with good bales at the time but this is the hard part right now because we don't get prolonged periods of of freezing. Um, so I don't know with that, that kind of wraps up uh, our little venture into this. Um, oh, the one comment that I will have, have to say is for the past three to four years, our best crop production amazingly always seems to be when it follows animals and grazing in the previous year. So there's a definite correlation there. I don't understand it all. Just know that it's really effective. So, AJ, with that, I'd gladly turn it back over to you. Uh, should allow us, you know, what about seven minutes for questions or comments. Um, I'd be glad to take any, uh, whatever we've got. No, yeah, thank you, Brett. I'm going to stay off camera. My internet keeps lagging. Um, but thank you, Brett. That was really, really informative. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to come off of mute or you can type them in the chat. Um, in our last six minutes here. Uh, yeah, I know my one of the questions I had is when you talk about that rotational pasture and you said in 2025, that's when you're gonna switch it back to crop production. How long do you think you keep it in crop production before you go back to livestock? I think a lot of that depends on how many other spots within the farm or farms close by that we can add those areas of rotational pasturing. Um, and, and maybe it also might be something to where we run it through a full cycle corn, beans, wheat. And then instead of going at it for five years, maybe it just goes back into for a year or two at a time. I don't know. I'd have to figure the economics of planting the hay crop, you know, um, and, and making sure that it's all worth it. But um, so I haven't really thought too far down the road. I'm, I, I'm more excited about seeing the impact of having that semi-permanent pasture and then going back to grain production. Nice. Um, oh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. I'll ask the first one's from Greg, who's asking, over the course of the entire year, 
what stocking rate do you plan on per acre? Okay, so this is where they're going to call me out because as I said at the beginning, I'm not a cattle guy. Um, I'm trying to get a better grasp on that. That's why I'm hoping that my my son will will move that direction in college. Um, I just know that I guess I usually think of a head per acre, especially on our permanent pastures. And, but the best example I'll use is um, when we were on that warm sea cover this past fall, we had the animals out there on about 25 acres and we had about 25 head of them down there on 25 acres for about two and a half months, if that is helpful. And that was a daily move and when those when those cows and and uh, yearling steers came back up from there they really looked slick they had a nice body conditioning almost the cows were almost a little too fat really um in my opinion but so i'm sorry i don't have the best answers again it's because i'm not a cattle guy i'm a grain farmer you know i'm a i'm a cca and and I, <laughs> not a guy i'm just making can the cows work for my crop production? Sorry. Thanks for the great questions. We're not um, done yet because there are a few more questions in the chat, but I do want to um, say that I did put a form inside of the chat, which is an evaluation for this program and tells us a little bit about you and what you'd like to see in a future program. So um, we would love to see you clicking on that and filling that out. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and the last question, thanks for mentioning that, Stephanie. Um, I'll also mention that if you registered for this Lunch and Learn, you automatically were registered for the next two. They're happening the last Wednesday of each month um, at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So since it was all about livestock and manure management, this registered you for this entire series, which is the next two months as well. Um, and our last question is, how many cattle, I believe, like how many cattle and how many acres do you have inside of your fence? Okay, so we're right now we're running at just near 30 and we knew that we're starting to exceed our numbers. Um, we were really lucky this last year because we had great moisture and so our pasture had good growth and we had enough other of rotational pastures that we were able to move them around to. But our goal is to continue to increase uh, the number of total cows. Right now, we're at like a dozen, 13. We eventually, our long-term goal is to be 2025, and so that's why we're going to we're moving this and trying to essentially double this operation on on another hundred acres adjacent to the farm that we're on. Um, so yeah, I I know that we've we've pushed our boundaries, and uh, I really don't want to be in that situation where we're starving because we go into a hot dry spell um, so if that we're 100 acres here on the home farm is is what we have and about 80 80 some acres of that is in uh, crop production and the remainder is in homestead permanent pasture semi-permanent pastures so if that's helpful Awesome. Uh, want to thank you one last time, Brett. I also think it's really important that you mentioned how much you learned from other people because, you know, we can't do anything in a vacuum. We're all learning from one another. So thank you for being transparent about that. Um, I think the one thing to remember on that is, is anytime that you can find somebody doing something you're interested in, as a farmer, they usually like to talk about it. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. It's a good, they like to talk about it. They're proud of what they're doing because they have reasons and they have motivation and they, they want to tell other people. And it doesn't mean you have to copy it and mirror it exactly. You only need to pull a piece out of it and you pull a piece out of someone else's and pretty soon you've got something that works well for your own operation. Thank you. Thanks everyone.